Alright guys, so top of the morning to you. I have a really epic feature for you here this morning. I'm with Matt, um, what's ripening. We just came from his farm and I'm in Fort Myers and it's about 7 a.m. And I am at just an epic demonstration site. And this place was kind of like a catalyst for me when I took my PDC in 2011. We came here, I actually took my PDC down in Naples, Florida. Um, we came here with the entire class and you know, this place kind of like opened my mind to you know, what you can do with permaculture. This is a demonstration site. You can really see all the different appropriate technologies, all the different plants, all the different fruits. I mean, like I've been back here probably 10 times since and every single time I have a great time, you know, visiting the farm, um, visiting the property. So I highly suggest if you come down to Florida, like Echo, Heart, like these are our two top, you know, open to the public demonstration sites that you can come and see. This place is pretty epic. They got lots of good stuff going on. Getting a special tour here this morning and uh, hope you guys are ready for this, so hold tight. Good morning, my name is Stacy Schwartz and we're here in North Fort Myers at Echo Global Farm. We are an international organization. We work in, with resourcing and training farmers in the tropics, most of whom are subsistence farmers or take a little bit of their produce to market. And so we're gonna give you guys a tour of the farm today or at least a really quick one and show you some of the systems we have in place, some of the crops that we're working with and give you a little bit of highlight of Echo. So welcome. We have uh, perennials and annuals mixed in everywhere, and you'll see that we have a lot of different demonstrations of agricultural systems on the farm. And we use those in multiple ways. In part, they're for training for our students that are here living on the farm, who are our interns. Um, but then we also bring in students during the year after week-long courses where we teach as well. And then of course we do a lot of our own tinkering and experimentation so that we can learn along the way. So all of these systems you guys are going to see today are a work in progress. None of them are stagnant, they don't stay the same, they all change as we learn and we adapt to what works best for us in this certain time or frame. So behind us we have our row of carambola um, or starfruit. So we work a lot with tropical fruit species that will help provide a lot of nutrition, especially for um, young children and um, nursing mothers. And in general for people, fruit adds a great part of their nutritional diet. So you'll see a lot of fruits smattered around everywhere. This is a small dwarf mango orchard where we're experimenting with how and which varieties dwarf well. So we've gotten this um, information from Fairchild down in Homestead and so we're experimenting with which varieties dwarf well in our context here. This is our duck and tilapia system. So in order to reduce costs for feeding some livestock, which can be a struggle for some farmers to find income for, we have ducks and tilapia working together in this system in a way that the ducks are going to be basically fertilizing through their manure, the um, water system, which will cause algal blooms, which then feed the fish. We also do sometimes feed these duck um, duckweed, which is a really high nutritious um, source of protein for them and we do harvest the eggs from these ducks. And we also, in the nighttime, we'll um, collect all of their manure and we'll wash it back into the water. So we add some more fertilizer as well. So this is one of my loves. I love pigs. And I was the, pig, the first pig intern here at Echo back when I was an intern in 2014. But in Thailand and in other areas in East Asia, instead of having pigs in, on straight on concrete, which was really common, now farmers are switching over to what's called a deep litter system, where they dig a hole in the ground and they add the components of compost and then put the pigs on top of that. And the compost actually absorbs a lot of the odor and smells that cause the piggeries to be really stinky and uncomfortable to work in. Um, and so we've replicated that here, but because we're in Florida, we can't dig them into the ground or they'd be swimming in a pool. So instead we built it up and we can see that our pigs are in here. We have two of our younger pigs right now, but these are American guinea hogs. They're a little bit slower to grow out and they can handle a more fodder-based diet, which is pretty common of other tropical pig species as well. 
So these guys get mostly fed forage off the farm instead of grain, which is the other common way of feeding and growing out pigs. These guys only get a cup of grain every day. So it's a lot more economical for our farmers to grow out livestock varieties and breeds such as these pigs here. And so what we'll do is over time they get fed forage um, and they will put a little bit of sawdust in there as our browns for our composting. And of course they're mixing it with their nose and they're adding their manure and their urine creating a nice rich compost. So actually take out these flats uh, once a year and we will remove the compost and all of that compost stays in this demonstration area or this garden, which is the lowland garden, which is also appropriate because most lowland areas have pigs. So we try to have these sustainable systems in which we're recycling those inputs just like we want our farmers to do as well. Recycle the inputs that you have. We have also intentional forage banks that we plant near all of our livestock so that as we are foraging and feeding them that we actually have a resource close to them so we're not carrying things long ways and also so that we have a ready-made nutritious um, source of food for them um, that we're intentionally growing so to make sure that they're healthy. So here we have some K-Tech, we have some mulberry and we have napier all around the back of that dwarf mango orchard as well which are the three main ingredients in our um, pig foraging. Which one's their favorite? They love mulberry. mulberry. Pretty much every animal loves mulberry. <laughs> Josh, that too. Yeah, okay. they all love them. They like napier a lot too, especially the, the bottom stem that has all the yeah. sugar. So here, um, we are about to plant rice, which is really exciting. And we model two different systems next to each other so that we can show the difference between one system and the other. This has been an ongoing experiment and research for the Lowlands intern, the, the intern that takes care of this area of the farm for almost 10 years now. Um, but here we can see the rice as seedlings right now. And we have two different seedling beds, again, for those two systems. The larger seedling bed right here is our traditional rice seedling bed. And then we have a small modified mat system, which is the system of rice intensification uh, seedling bed. And so these will go out onto their respective patties and we'll get to watch how the ricelings grow in those different aspects. That's a word I the a word I coined the phrase of riceling. Ricelings. Okay. <laughs> rice seedling, riceling. So that's our SRI modified mat. Ricelets. Oh, I like that one too. And then these are traditional. And these guys are a week old in one day. This is a week old in one day. Yes. And if you come back in a, a three or four weeks, we'll have both of these planted out, which is really exciting. And this is a system, the system of rice intensification has undergone a lot of research in Madagascar and in West Africa and also now in Asia a lot too. It doesn't work for every farmer and Echo is really about that. We don't have one silver bullet that's going to work for everybody, but we do want to present a lot of options for farming systems that may work in your context or you may need to adjust. So we want farmers to be creative and experiment and try different things and see what options might work best for their systems. We also have a lot of bananas on the farm. We use the leaves a lot for foraging, of course, purposes, but then we also just really love banana production. Who doesn't love bananas? So on the farm, historically, we have had um, almost all of the FIA varieties. I believe we've had 22 or 24 um, was our max collection. I don't know a lot about the different individual species except that, or individual varieties, except that Sweetheart is my favorite. <laughs> so, but um, every row in the lowlands here is a different vari FIA variety. Um, so including Sweetheart is in this area of the farm as well. Um, so we have a lot of bananas. They're a great resource for farmers. Not only do they have a great nutrition profile as a ripe fruit, but as a green fruit, you can use it as a starch and that's really common especially in East Africa um, and in Asia as well. So this is one of my favorite parts of the farm. When I was an intern I really loved planting out this area. This is our Thai kitchen garden and so this is basically a small microclimate of different canopy levels that you would want right by your home that you can go and pick herbs or go and pick a leafy green really quickly um, and get things. So this has both annuals and perennials in this kitchen garden. We have a peanut butter fruit, we have lots of hot peppers and flowers, and we have some lago spinach, which is an edible. We have the um, lime leaf, we have all sorts of fun things, and then even one of those dwarf mangoes. So it's a nice little ecosystem of different uh, perennials and annuals and leafy greens and other things um, so that we can have something close to our kitchen that can give us some nutrition and be ready made for us. 
Okay, so this is the mountain. So we've now left the lowland demonstration area of the farm and we've entered the mountain. And the mountain is one of the really important areas of the farm because most of our small farmers who are income scarce or income limited are pushed from the lowlands, which is nice rich soil, up into the highlands. And the reason the lowlands has rich soils is because it's all fallen from soil erosion off the highlands. And so here we have two demonstrations, one um, terracing with rocks or any physical barrier that you can create or that you have in your area versus a sloping agricultural land technology. And what that simply is, is using plants to do the same thing. So you'll have one row of a grass species, which has nice fibrous roots. This one here is napier paired with a forage species. So this row here is Lucena with this napier. And so we have those different terraces going up the mountainside. And again, we plant this intentionally for our foraging for our animals. Mountain areas are also well known for their grains. So this is where we'll grow a lot of our grains, including amaranth, which is at the end of its season. But here we have uh, vetiver, and desmodium up there. And then up this one, we have had guinea grass, but it got overtaken. And we have glaricidia in that tree. Beautiful banana. So this is a great place where you can see a lot of the farm. I love going on the mountain and just getting a break. You can see the beauty, especially in the middle of summer where there's just green everywhere. It's beautiful up here. We also still have some lychees. You guys are welcome to have some if you whoa, can reach them. Whoa. Matt, you heard that. You're the tall guy, man. Come on. You notice they're completely bare to like yeah, reaching really height? Reach, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the rest has been already destroyed. By hey, ice. Not everybody's what's ripening tall over here, bro. I, I need my picker. Fruits. Oh, man. I just pulled mine out of the truck. See this nice, these nice nut on here. And this is a spineless variety that our propagation manager found. Can you say that again for the camera? It's a spineless nut on here, and it makes a really good juice. It's delicious. Sour? It's a little bit sour. Um, we have one of our staff members is from the Dominican Republic, and he grew up with it. So he has like a really great juice mixture where it gets it sweeter. Yeah. So these are peanuts, for those of you who haven't grown peanuts before. They're a major crop, especially in West Africa. Um, but you can see the little tiny flowers. Um, the peanut does actually flower and fruit above ground. And then it, as the weight of the flower increases, it will actually go and then it will become subterranean after that, which is pretty cool. Our highland demonstration is also important for the areas of the tropics that have high elevation. You can actually have a temperate climate in the tropics solely because of your elevation adjusts to. This is our zero graze. So we do advocate in some areas for zero graze or we encourage farmers if it's appropriate for them to zero graze their animals. What this does, it gets them off the ground so they're not interacting with their feces at all. And so it reduces the amount of worming that you have to do for your goats. It also does help goats from being as destructive in certain communities. Um, Goats are, are really good bra brazers. They'll go around and they'll eat a little bit of everything, a little bit of everything. That can sometimes be destructive, but also if you have a goat and put it on pasture, they're very destructive for pastures. They're not like a sheep or a cow that can manage um, the grass in a way that doesn't kill the grass. They'll actually chomp below the growing point, and so goats will kill grass. And so in a lot of areas, if instead of you can take them off pasture and put them into a zero graze system, it'll help the health of your pastures, which is really important for desert areas that are increasing up here and these are our two milking goats both of these girls are milking right now they had their babies and now they go I see sweet potato and beans and bamboo yeah. these are good milkers and they're very sweet both of them were bottle fed um, when you bottle feed goats, they become a lot more people loving. Yes, yes you are. You're a very sweet goat. And here we also have our row of avocado. We have had incidences of laurel wilt, so we've had to take out some of our avocado, but we do still have 
a large range of varieties for avocado. When I was an intern back in 2014, we had enough to last us 10 months out of the year of avocado production, which was really awesome. Now this isn't the regular peanut. Is this all perennial peanut? This is mostly? all perennial peanut, correct. Nice, nice perennial peanut berm. Looks like they just scythed it or weeded it recently. Weeded it, huh? yep. We, we tip it all so that we can get new flushes of growth on there. We also do a lot of work with neem, which is flowering right now, which I really find beautiful. Love neem. Neem, awesome. Neem. So neem is an antifungal, antibacterial. It's also used as an insecticide. You can soak the leaves or you can get a higher concentration if you soak the seeds of the azadiractin property that is a really good natural insecticide for certain pests. Mm -hmm. So it's used for that. And when I lived in East Africa, you, one of the people group that I lived with would just take a branch off and brush their teeth with it, with the, the inside of the pith of the, of the stem. So that was really cool. And because it has that antibacterial property, so it can clean your teeth. For you. We do have Aki as well. Is that is, what that is back yes. here? I thought so. Okay. <laughs> we took out our only other Aki tree on the farm. This is the, oh no, we still have two. We still have two trees. But this is Aki. You cannot eat it right now. Please do not even try. Um, it is a poisonous fruit at different stages of the life of the fruit, but at one specific stage it is edible and it tastes kind of like a cashew. Uh, it's very nice, nutty, creamy texture to it, um, but you have to wait until all of these open up. And then you can't wait too long after they're open or else it becomes toxic again. But it's a great fruit option, um, especially in an agroforestry or foods food forest system because again because it's toxic you don't want to eat a whole lot of it just a little bit of this a little bit of that kind of like our goats we also do all three types of composting here on the farm we do cold composting we have hot composting and we also do worm composting so here are our worm bins to my left where we house our worms we're currently trying to also create smaller systems for our worms so we can do it at a smaller scale as if someone's doing it in their home garden so right now most of our worms are actually in the urban garden so we redesigned this area of the farm. We're now out of the highlands and we're now entering the monsoon. We redesigned this recently with Brad Ward um, and he very much wanted a permaculture focus. So what we have on the outside of this area are our perennials. So our fruit trees, our um, less labor intensive perennials are all on the outside of this area so that we have um, less energy to go out and take care of them because they're perennials, they need less maintenance. And then we have all of our annuals that are much closer to our our home or our dwelling. So you'll see that we have a lot of perennials on the outside here. Before we get to things, we have our mangoes, we have our banana circles, things like that. And then as we get closer to the homestead, we have more of our annuals. We have our chickens, because we do want to make sure we take good care of our chickens and our more intensive, labor intensive vegetable production as well. And we still have beautiful Is that all like a velvet bean? Yes, that's all Makuna velvet bean. Wow. And we have sesame growing here as well. We've been trying sesame to find the like perfect window for it here in Florida. This so, is beautiful. Yeah, it looks really great. The downside is some of them you can see here are lodging right now. So we're trying to find the right season for us here for sesame so that we don't also get mold on the pods. That's been another issue that we've had to work through. But yeah. yeah. It could be a pretty awesome oil. Yes, yeah, and a good, uh, really nutritious um, oil for um, small scale farmers too. And then we have our homestead here with some landscaping plants because we need those too. We need butterflies, we need flowers, we need bees. And we have a lot of ground covers is what you'll see us starting to focus on. So we have our sweet potato plantings are going out now um, so we can cover the ground before the heat of the rainy season when we get a lot of weed pressure. So you guys growing your own mulch cover. over here? Yes, we do. So we try to, and this is a short pile of mulch, we try to put in areas where we have raised bed examples, we'll put vetiver really close by so that we can simply chop and drop that mulch instead of having to, again, go out to get a resource. Try and grow everything that you need within your system. So this is her mulch row, which she can chop and drop onto her raised beds as she needs mulch. So we, cut, we go through and cut our vetiver at least twice a year, um, sometimes more than that, but usually when we rebuild the beds, we'll chop. And we're switching all of our livestock, or as many as possible, over to that litter system. So these chickens also have sawdust underneath their coop, so that overnight and during the day, if there are some in here laying eggs and such, we can collect their manure in that sawdust and be able to use that elsewhere. 
Otherwise, it makes it really difficult specifically for chickens to collect their manure. I think you guys still have to use some external feeds. Yes, we for do. Chickens. For chickens, we do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, tough. Mm -hmm. We do feed them, especially some of this chaya. They really like chaya. And raw? They can, yes. Really? So fowl can consume chaya raw. Um, you can feed a little bit to goats and a little bit to cattle, but you have to make sure it's less than 20% of their feed um, by weight. And then, of course, for all humans, you must cook chaya. Please cook chaya. Ooh, I yeah. just learned something new. Thank you, Stacy. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, you can feed it to fowl. They love it. And we do feed it to our goats a little bit. We don't. We try to keep it away from our cattle as much as possible because cattle are a little bit more sensitive than goats. A little keyhole demonstration, huh? Yes, we have a keyhole. So this is a keyhole garden. It's great for anybody who um, doesn't like to bend over or can't because of back problems. I can actually stand up here and work in my garden without having to to bend over too much. And then we compost everything in here. So again, this is almost itself its own system because after we compost and use things in here, we can take out this compost and put it uh, back onto the keyhole garden as well. And we actually made all these bricks here at Echo as well. You made the bricks? We made the bricks, yeah. Wow. Which is really cool. We have a brick press in the AT area. So we've left the monsoon now and we're entering into the community garden where we have a lot of more interactive ways that we can engage children, we can engage school groups, we can engage church groups and gardening. And what does that mean for them? So we have, again, the keyhole garden, we have some square foot gardenings, which are really popular with, with students especially. Um, and then just creative de designs and colors to bring out and pop some of the beauty of creation um, and some of the, the agricultural systems. We also have a hedgerow back there of moringa and chaya again and this is the other moringa which is also flowering you guys came at a good time this is moringa stenopatala so this is the african moringa you can see beautiful flowers in that guy this this yes this is wow. <laughs> this is a very big species and it doesn't you'll notice it's starting to drop all of its leaves it doesn't love a lot of water and so right now it's going to drop a bunch of its leaves during the rainy season but it always comes back for us here um, and this is the biggest one we have on the farm of the african moringa and we have a composting latrine back there. I think almost everybody uses it on the farm, which is great. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. So there's no water running to that system. It's just um, entirely your own recycled waste, which is great. And then we do have a wash station, which does have water on the back side, so you can wash your hands still. But this is also a great place where we hold some trainings. This is our global classroom. Um, and this is where we do some teaching or exercises, as well as we have a break usually in our public tour here um, in the global classroom. But this is a great atmosphere, especially when you are working with people who are development workers overseas or missionaries. We all just sit here and relax and hear each other's stories. And that's what I love about this atmosphere here. It's very welcoming, it's very community oriented. And it's great to have a space like that in your garden or in your community where everybody can just come together and share with one another their experiences, what they're going through and, and just kind of bring everybody together. So that's kind of what this place is on the farm for me.